service today. Um, as we've done, I will invite you to sign the attendance pads that are that are there in your pew, um, and um, or have somebody sign for you. Uh, but go ahead and do that. Now, I do want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Hopefully everybody got themselves a bulletin. As she came in, there's a couple of things. You can read the front of the bulletin. Um, there is something coming up that's not in the bulletin that I am going to need some help with if anybody is available. Um, a week from tomorrow, we are scheduled to serve a meal out at the Wesley. Um, I got word this morning, the person that was supposed to coordinate that meal is going to be having surgery, elective surgery that day. And so I'm looking for some help. So if anybody is interested in helping with that, um, please see me after the service or text me, call me, and we'll see what we can do. Also, on the green insert, um, there's two announcements there. One is about um, something that Amanda Gilliland put me on to um, this past week, that, that there is a need out at the college again. And you can read about that, that we have students out there that that are unable to, um, to meet some of the basic needs. And so um, if you are interested in helping with that, I think we've got on there what, what you need to do and what is needed. Also, some of you are aware that um, there are some decisions coming up in the United Methodist Church that each Methodist church is um, going to need to make some decisions, and we are likely as well. Um, and so there's a couple of meetings coming up, not this coming week, but the following week. These two meetings will be coming from two different perspectives, which I personally find very helpful when I have a decision to make. I love to be able to hear what one side says and then hear what another side says and then form my own opinion. And so if you want any more information on that, again, please see me. We're going to be talking about some of these things, these issues coming up this fall. And so but with that in mind, um, let's stand and let's welcome the Lord's presence this morning. Father God, you are God. You, you are bigger. Lord, um, you are holy. You are creator. You are everlasting Father. And we thank you. And we praise you this morning. Lord, as we turn our eyes towards you, Father, we pray that you open our hearts, open our eyes to see and worship you. In Christ's name, amen.
that who Jesus was, that he was the Son of God. Now, when we come into worship, we have different things in our sanctuary that remind us about who Jesus is. When we're down there, when we get down back in the fellowship hall for the bridge, we're going to have a big cross right in front of the window. Okay? And it reminds us of Jesus. But up here, we've got a cross. On the wall back there at the back, it reminds us of Jesus. Okay? Let's pray. All right? I want y'all to help me this morning. And all the big folks out here, I'm going to invite you to pray along with our boys and girls, okay? Will you repeat after me? Dear God, Dear God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for dying on the cross. For me. For me. For my family. For my family. For my friends. For my friends. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all may go on back to the seats. many of y'all have a specific person that is on your heart who needs prayer this morning? You don't have to tell me who it is, but, okay. Um, you know, I do. When I was having my quiet time this morning, there was somebody on my heart this morning that, uh, a family a family in our church that um, that I know is facing some real challenges right now. And, and I haven't been able to get this family off my heart all, all morning. And I'm not, um, but you have those needs as well. Okay? Might be somebody in your family. It might be a friend. It might be somebody that you go to school with, that you work with might be a teacher, a particular student that um, just um, you can tell as they come into class that, that they just got a lot going on and they're facing challenges that no child should have to face. Um, whoever that is, I want you to think of them right now. Okay? Let's pray together. Father God, the challenges are many. The challenges are real. The challenges at times can be overwhelming and intense. And Lord God, all our hope is in Jesus. We thank you that yesterday's gone. Lord, we thank you that when we look at the cross here in this sanctuary, that, that the cross is empty, that death has been defeated, not just on Easter Sunday during the spring, but on every Sunday, in every day, at every moment. That the greatest thing that the devil could throw at us has been defeated because you rose from the dead. And Lord God, that person or persons who are on our hearts this morning, Lord, whatever the need happens to be, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, or Lord, maybe it's just that emptiness and the brokenness and just the hope that 
I just hope I can survive this and that things will turn around. Father God, we thank you that the story didn't end with the cross at Calvary. The story continues through resurrection and through um, into our lives. And so now, I want to invite you just silently to lay that person on the altar to you, to Jesus right now. Give him their needs, your needs. And now will you join together with me in praying as Jesus taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from me. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I want to invite you to take your sermon notes. Um, if you choose to follow along that way. Um, now, I don't know about you. Because everybody that, not, not everybody comes from the same tradition. Okay? Um, but in the church that I grew up in, Every Sunday morning, we stood and we said the Apostles' Creed or another creed together. Sometimes, most of the time, it was the Apostles' Creed. Sometimes it was the Nicene Creed or another creed. Um, now, again, I don't know about you <coughs> because some churches do, some churches don't. And I'm not here to say that one is right and one is wrong. That's not my point. But I will say this, because of that tradition that in my church growing up, I learned the words of the Apostles' Creed from when I was a young boy. I could say them in my sleep. Um, some Sundays I think I did. Um, you know, I could say them without even thinking about them. Um, many Sundays, I think I did. And I hate to admit it, sometimes I'm still that way. Sometimes I can stand up here and I can say the words of the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, or any other creed, and I can say the words without even thinking about what I'm saying. Now, I'm not going to ask. I may be the only one in here that has ever done that, but my hunch is I'm probably not. Um, <clears throat> now, honestly, sometimes when I stand up here, because I'm facing you, and sometimes I'll have a microphone, or, um, and, and if, you know, sometimes I'm aware, so aware of my tendency to get the words mixed up, I will try my best to hone in and focus on what I'm saying. Have you ever done that? And I've tried to focus so much on each individual phrase that before I know it, I've lost my place. And because I'm wearing a microphone or I'm speaking it, everybody knows when I mess my place. By the way, I've done that numerous times in the Lord's Prayer as well. Um, that I will mess it up. But in spite of my inability 
in spite of me messing it up, I want to say the Apostles' Creed has and holds a very important place in my life. Because as we saw last week, that I'm in this series that I'm calling We Believe. By the way, there is, um, there, there is actually a real method to my madness. Before we even address in the church some of the division in the Methodist church and the, the, some of the decisions that we may have to make, um, I'm trying to start with the basics. And I don't know any better way than to do that by beginning with basic Christian beliefs. And last Sunday, when we began this series, I spoke about the phrase, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Um, now, we saw last week that, um, that, that God the Father is both intensely personal, but yet infinitely powerful. Simultaneously, at the same time, he is both intensely personal. We see that in the word Father, and he's infinitely powerful. We see that in the word Maker, or the word Creator. Now, the Apostles' Creed is not the only creed. It's the one that I'm using for this series, but the the the... Historically, there have been two creeds that have been used to summarize the Christian faith. Okay, you've got the Apostles' Creed, but there's also the Nicene Creed. We don't have so many slides today. Okay, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, there they are. Okay. Um, there's, there's, there's two, um, two creeds. You've got the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Now, there's um, two primary purposes of the creeds. Okay? One is to correct error, and the other is to instruct believers. Okay? Originally, the Apostles' Creed, it was in, in the form that people just stood and said together in a service. Originally, it was like this. When uh, someone was to be baptized, the preacher would stand before him and he would say, Do you believe in God the Father? And they would respond, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then he would say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they would say, I believe in Jesus Christ, this only Son, our Lord. And then they would go on with that. It was a way to instruct and teach Christians, but also it was a way to correct error. Have any of y'all ever heard of a guy by the name of Victor Paul Weirwill? I don't know why anybody would name their son that, but that was his name. He lived up in Ohio. Um, he founded a group that claimed to be Christian. In fact, the name of the group was The Way International. Um, I happen to know a little bit about this because I've had family members that got involved in this group. Now, Victor Paul Weirwill says that the group is a Christian group, but their beliefs are summarized in a book that he wrote. The title of that book is this, Jesus Christ is Not God. The Apostles' Creed helps us correct and identify error. 
You know, I drove by a church last week a couple of times that doesn't believe, their teaching doesn't believe in the virgin birth. The Apostles' Creed helps us identify and correct error. It teaches us what the main things are. That is why before we look at the things that are pulling us apart, we're taking several weeks and looking at what we do believe, what the basic beliefs of the Christian are. Now, honestly, it doesn't matter to me whether you have memorized the creed or not. Okay? But what does matter to me is whether you believe it. Because we don't say, I have memorized, or I know, check me off, give me an A, Jesus. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Last week we looked at... Um, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Um, by the way, when we stand, and at the end of this service, we're going to stand, and I invite you, if you choose to, to join us together, as we did last week, um, and to say the words of the Apostles' Creed again. But when we do that, we are, in effect, we are doing two things. Okay? Number one, we are rejecting the worldview of our day that says that the secret to meaning is having more, being successful. Okay? We're rejecting that worldview. And at the same time, we are proclaiming our faith in the triune God of the Bible. Now, the word triune is just a fancy word that refers to that God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? In the Apostles' Creed, there's three sections. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to take a look at God the Son, at Jesus. If you look at the words, you've got them in your sermon notes, but if you look at the words that well over half of the creed is about Jesus. Okay. Um, I counted up the words, I can't remember, but over half of the creed is about Jesus. Interesting. I also want you to know, it doesn't say anything about his teaching. It doesn't say anything about the Sermon on the Mount, about loving your enemies, or praying for those who persecute you. The, the creed doesn't say anything about that. It doesn't mean that it's unimportant. But we're getting at the basic of the basics. And so today, we come to this section of the creed where we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Now what I want you to see in this, before we even look at anything that He did, before we look at His crucifixion, His resurrection, before we look at His birth, we have to look at who Jesus is. At who he is. Because if Jesus was not God, as Victor Paul Weirwill says, then anything that he did has no impact on you and me. Because who he is sets the table 
for what he did. Think of it this way. It's great that somebody would die for others. But Jesus wasn't the only one that was crucified. There were two thieves that were crucified with them. And there were countless others who were crucified at, at, during that time as well. But here's my question. What did their death do for you? Absolutely nothing. Many of them, perhaps all of them, deserved to die. The reason why Jesus' death means something to us is because of who he is. So, who is he? Some will say, I've heard one person in this town, one person here in town that says that Jesus was, that he was, he was just a good moral example. He was the best person that ever lived. Well, he was that. But guys, he was so much more. He was God in the flesh. In Philippians, I don't have this note, this in there, but in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about how Jesus, or first in John chapter 1, it talks about that Jesus was with God the Father when the creation happened, when God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was there. He had been on the throne in heaven for all of eternity and he willingly stepped off the throne clothed himself in human skin and stepped in to our messed up world. That's who he is. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter replied that um, you are the Messiah, the Son, the Messiah, God. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Now there's a lot of people there want Jesus to be their Savior but not their Lord. They want fire insurance for God to protect them from hell because they don't want to go to hell. They don't want to burn. Right? Fire insurance. Okay? So that my ticket gets punched to heaven. But they have no desire for Jesus to be their Lord. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as Lord over 300 times. The word Lord literally means master or king. When you say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, you are saying that you stake everything on him calling the shots. That's a pretty radical statement. Can he be trusted? Will you tell me? <coughs> he willingly left heaven, stepped down to this earth, clothed himself in human flesh, entered into our messed up world, the one who knows everything about you, but loves you enough to go to that cross and to suffer and die for you. Is he worthy of your trust? That's your Lord. Mm. The creed continues. We began by 
I believe in who Jesus is, His only Son, our Lord. And then we come to um, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This church that I drove by, that that denomination does not believe in the Virgin birth. Well, Scripture does. Isaiah promised, prophesied it in Isaiah chapter 7. He prophesied about Jesus hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And he says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. You may have heard that around Christmas a time or two. An angel appeared to Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, um, in, in Matthew 1. But after Joseph, it says he, but the, the context refers to Joseph. But after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Charles Wesley wrote a well-known Christmas carol. You've got the words in your notes that talk about um, the Holy Spirit conception. The virgin birth. Now here's my question. So what? Right? So what? Does it really matter? I want to suggest to you absolutely. It matters big time. And the reason is this. In order for Jesus to die for our sins, he had to be the perfect sacrifice. And to be the perfect sacrifice, that means that he had to be completely unstained by sin. That's why those other folks that were crucified, that died, that's why their death does not give you any benefit whatsoever. It doesn't give me any benefit either but Jesus is did. Now sin, the Bible tells us that there are two ways that we become sinners. First by our actions. Okay, you know about that right? I do too. By our thoughts, our words, our deeds, sins of commission, things that we do that we shouldn't do. Sins of omission, things that we don't do that we should do. Our actions, all right? I don't know that I'm going to have to convince you that we are all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But there is another kind of sin the Bible talks about, and that is inherited sin. Inherited sin. You know, um, in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Apostle Paul wrote this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, referring to Adam, and death through sin, in this way death came to all people, because all have sinned. In other words, because of inherited sin, we are all born with a sin nature. We have a natural proclivity, a natural tendency to sin. Who teaches a child how to say mine? Who teaches humans selfishness? 
Well, it's in our nature. Right? We're born that way. And that alone makes us guilty. But Jesus wasn't born in the same way. He was born with a Holy Spirit conception of virgin birth. And so he wasn't afflicted by this same sin tendency, this sinful nature that you and I have been born with. Okay. Go on. Um, substitutionary atonement basically says this, that Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for you and me. I believe that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Substitutionary atonement. Y'all, this is the essentials, the basics that are so deep will never be able to truly and completely understand the depth of it. But when Jesus died on Good Friday, that wasn't the end of the story. Because on Saturday, the Bible tells us that Jesus descended into the place of the dead. In your sermon notes, I put a couple of asterisks in there that many times that we think of in the traditional use of the creed that it doesn't skip ahead and jump ahead to Easter Sunday morning. It says that he descended into hell. Did you know what he did on Saturday? You know why that's important? What about all those saints in the Old Testament who had died? And yet they were faithful. Jesus went to get them. He went to get King David. He went to get Isaiah and Jeremiah and the other prophets. He went to get those who had lived faithful lives before he died. And then on Sunday, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence. He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Mm. Y'all, it don't get no better than that. That, this is so deep. I will never, with my limited brain capacity, we'll never be able to fully explore the riches of what we provide. I want to invite our acolytes to come, but as they do, I want to invite you to focus on what we say about Jesus. Will you focus on him? Right now, as our acolytes come
will you stand with her? And together, if you choose to, will you serve what you pray? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born by the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended in death and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Go from here, living what you say you believe. As always, life groups are available. We invite you to grab a cup of coffee, grab a snack down in the kitchen on your way to the life group.